All right, so where should I keep my money? Now, I work at the Department of Banking and Securities, so obviously I'm going to tell you, you should put, keep your money in a credit union. <clears throat> Banks or credit unions are the two most typical places people keep their money. And a lot of people out there do not understand quite the difference between a credit union and a bank. Now, luckily, as state employees, we have access to um, PSCCU. Actually, I don't because we regulate them. I can't bank with them. But credit unions tend to be sort of membership driven. There's a field of membership. It may be the community you live in or worship or work in, or it may be for a specific company like PSECU is for state employees. Um, credit unions are not for profit organizations. They tend to give the benefits that they, their earnings kind of come back to you if you're a customer of that credit union. Um, they tend to have a lot more financial education opportunities. They're out in the community trying to, trying to help people um, frequently. So, and you will find lower fees at credit unions. Now, when we go over to the bank side of things, um, they are for-profit institutions. Um, we're seeing a lot of bank mergers, so they seem to be getting bigger and bigger. And um, this is Becky McDickin talking, not the Department of Banking, but banks tend to be more expensive than credit unions. However, having said that, they do provide more services than credit unions often. They have, um, they have places where you can get um, financial in advice, and not that credit unions don't, because they do too, but they have other benefits to them um, that sometimes credit unions can offer if they're a small membership field-driven organization. Um, banks tend to be a little more, I have a few more branches out there, um, although credit unions have been coming up in the past years with the, the numbers of branches you can find. When you're looking for where you should keep your money or your customers are asking, obviously find out what's convenient, what's in your neighborhood, where are the ATMs. Um, one thing that's really important, especially if someone's having um, financial trouble, is realizing every time you use the ATM, if it's not in your network, and you're being charged $2.50, $3, that starts adding up if you do that a couple times a week, and that's money you're just, you're just handing another institution. So it's important to find a bank or credit union that's convenient to you. Um, comparison shopping, some of the things to ask them is, okay, how much do you charge for uh, checks? Um, a lot of people are getting away from writing checks nowadays. We're doing a lot of our banking online, so that may not be quite as relevant a question, but you know, are there a certain amount of checks you can write before there's a fee? Um, when are your accounts available? If I deposit a, a check to, um, from my mom today, when's the money ready? When can I actually get access to it? Is it right away? Is it, does it depend on what's in my savings account? What's it linked to? Um, you want to know about fund availability. Um, are they open to everybody? I mean, again, if you're a certain credit union, if you live in the neighborhood, or you, you, know, you have to fall in a certain membership category to work at a, or bank at a credit union, um, whereas banks are open to everyone. But you want to look for the ATM availability. You want to see what kind of services they have available online. Can you transfer funds from one account to another, from one institution to another? Like I need, oh, I've got this PNC bank account over here. I need to pay a credit card bill over there, and I'm going to transfer from my credit union to PNC. Can I do those types of things, and do they charge me? Um, you want to look for the fees associated just with opening accounts. Oftentimes, a credit union charges you $5 to open an account and there's no fee minimums sometimes. Um, you want to be asking, what's the minimum fee I need to have um, or balance I need to have in my account? What's the minimum to open? What kind of other monthly fees might I be charged? Um, and lastly are the accounts ins insured. Um, most banks and credit unions are insured by either the FDIC, which is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the, uh-oh, um, there's a credit union equivalent, NCUA. Uh, National Credit Union Administration, um, and they insure accounts up to $250,000 per account per person. So if you happen to have $500,000, you probably want to have a great problem to have. You have to open two <laughs> accounts to make sure it's properly insured. Um, but most, most places are insured. Now, when I say that, what isn't insured? Um, something like PayPal. If you do transactions and, and send money through PayPal to people, that is not an insured banking entity. So you, you may lose money if something goes wrong with the system, if there's a glitch. Um, it's not an insured account. So just as an example. Some of the services, obviously, that you get at credit unions and banks, checking accounts, savings accounts, debit cards. Um, we're all using those nowadays. It's like having cash in your wallet, more dangerous. <laughs> Sometimes cash is better if you're trying to stick to your money map. 
Um, online banking, a great way to pay bills. I was hesitant for years, and if, if I don't know why I was, was holding back, because it's just so easy, and you can do it in about three minutes' time. So instead of writing a mil million checks and buying stamps, um, again, you want to look for ATMs. And then if you like, it's really nice to be able to build a relationship with the people inside the institution. Now, PSCCU doesn't have branches, so that's the one, um, I guess, uh, Except, exception to the rule. It's harder to build a relationship because you can't walk in and see the same bank teller every week because they're not really, they're not there to do those types of transactions. Um, whereas at a, another credit union or another bank, you may be able to actually go in, see the same person week after week at the reception area, see the same tellers, you get to know them. The good thing about building that relationship is that when you have a question then, they can direct you to the right place within the institution and say, oh, you need to, maybe you want to think about a personal loan, go see Bill. Maybe you, know, you need to talk about a car, go see Rita, whatever it might be. So um, it's good to know who you're talking to and trust them and build that relationship. A couple things we, we highly encourage people to really think about before doing. I'm not going to say don't do it, but check cashers are out there in the state of Pennsylvania. They will gladly cash your check for a fee. Usually it costs you a percentage, um, 3 to 7 percent, depending on the organization that's doing that. Um, it's, it's also, if you use a check casher, it probably means you don't have a bank account, which means you're then carrying a large wad of cash around in your pocket. Um, some people like to do this because it makes them feel, feel good about themselves. You're also a target for being robbed, which you can't get your money back if that happens. It's a safety issue. So we highly encourage you to have bank accounts, whether it's at a credit union or bank, um, and not use check cashers. Um, we want to make sure everybody knows anybody out there who may not have a bank account. Um, maybe they don't have one because they bounced too many checks in the past and they got kicked out of the system. So they have no choice but to use check cashers. Well, we want to make sure then that the check cashers are properly licensed, and that is actually one of the things our department does at the Department of Banking and Securities. We make sure these entities have a license to operate in Pennsylvania. So you can call our 1-800 number, which is 1-800-PA-BANKS, um, and find out if someone is properly licensed. If you've got a customer that comes to you and says, well, I went and I got my check cashed at the, you know, um, you can actually look up if that entity is properly licensed, if there's anything questionable about it. So um, you can also use our 1-800 number while I'm on the subject um, to file complaints. If you have somebody that, you know, a customer that gets ripped off um, or the bank seems to be charging them way too many fees and the bank won't talk to the customer anymore, you can call our 1-800 number. We have live people that answer the phone, um, not 24-7, but they're there working hours Monday through Friday and we'll get back to you within 24 um 24 hours if you leave a message and they don't answer the phone. But you can file complaints and um, with our consumer services. Well, along the same lines of uh, consumer safety, identity theft, we have to talk about it. It's a hot topic these days, probably the fastest growing crime out there. And um, what it is basically is someone steals your personal information and uses it to spend your money, essentially. And a, a couple of things can happen as a result of your information being stolen, which I think is important to, to, to know specifics. They can take out loans or credit cards in your name. They can also rent an apartment, sign up for utilities, all of those things in your name. They can use your ATM card and get your cash. They can also apply for a driver's license or state ID with their picture but your name. Does that make sense? Their picture but your name. So they can become you in, in, uh, from, from an official standpoint. They can also use your social security card and information in order to apply for government benefits. So you see how important this can be with not only ourselves, but our customers. We really need to encourage them to take precautions in protecting their information. And what are some of the things that you can do? Of course, never throw away any personal information into the trash, shred it. People have no problem, th identity thieves have no problem going into trash cans to get information. You know, a little bit of dirt means a lot of money in their pocket. It's okay to them. Um, also, when you're online and when your customers are online, make sure that they're using secured sites with the HTTPS, um, they had, that had the S in the, in the, in the web page, uh, along with the, there's an icon for a lock, and, and there's a picture of that on the screen right now, um, the, the lock symbol, so you know you're on a secured site. 
be aware of your surroundings, whether you're making purchases, you're at the ATM machine, you know, just always be aware of people around you. Be cautious when giving out your social security number. Do not give out your social security number to somebody who calls you and asks, asks it for, from you. There's, there's really no reason, you know, banks aren't going to call you, financial institutions aren't going to call you and say, hey, what's your social security number so we can confirm your account? No, they don't do things like that. For um, example, it, a scam that's currently going on is you'll get a call and it's somebody saying, oh, I'm with the, um, the county court office and you didn't show up for jury duty today. And you say, wait a minute, what? I didn't get a summons for jury duty. And then you get all flustered, and they say, well, there's a, a bench warrant out for you now because you didn't show up, which is not true. But um, if you don't know that and you're flustered, then they say, well, we have this is your name, this is your address. Now, what's your Social Security number? And if you're flustered and you spit it out at them, now they've got everything. So these are the types of things scammers are doing, um, or the IRS will call you at home. That's another really big one. How many have gotten that phone call lately saying they're, you're being sued, which the IRS doesn't sue you, they audit you. But at any rate, um, things like that, never give out your Social Security social security number over the phone well one of the just a personal story too (laughs) um my son who's just turned 19 got a got an email from um, apple this isn't an advertisement but from apple they wanted all of the information to confirm his account so they wanted his name address credit card number social security number phone number all of that and being a young person he was very, you know, well, I don't understand this. So he says, what am I supposed to do with this? And I said, nothing. I said, stop. They, the customer or companies don't ask you for a verification of all of this information. So it's really, you have to be diligent. Young people have to be diligent. Certainly with our customers, um, you know, who may not be exposed to this information, we really have to, you know, be, be generous with, with what we're telling them and helping them to protect themselves. Um, again, keep account information, social security card, all of that in a secure location. Um, and when, if our customers ask someone to help them uh, um, access, access their, their account information or make a financial transaction for them, be sure that we have, we tell the customers to keep track of all receipts and all statements related to somebody else helping them with that transaction. And last but not least, look at uh, user IDs and PIN numbers to make sure that they're not, people can't figure them out. And for that. Also, too, make sure that they're using it on the right, like a device that is safe. I went to the mall and some girl asked me, she was very, like, really young. She's like, oh, can I use your phone to transfer money? And I looked at her and I go, do you know that that will store all of your information in my phone? And she didn't understand it. Good and, point. Like, I just kind of was just like, no, that does not sound safe. So making sure that you're using like secure devices makes a big difference. Right, and they're your devices. The, the yeah. comment was make sure that you're using secure devices and that they're your own devices. Don't allow someone to, you know, ask and use your phone to, to transfer money, or don't you ask somebody else to, to transfer money from their phone. You have to be very aware of protecting your information and not giving it out, you know, innocently or, or what have you because of that. So, Becky, for... One of the things that we're doing in the Pennsylvania Department of Banking and Securities right now is a cybersecurity task force, and we've been putting together materials. Um, hopefully, there's actually going to be a website under the governor shortly that everybody can utilize within the Commonwealth um, talking about cybersecurity. And um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was passwords. And this is really funny because. Um, Well, okay, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, We want to make sure people are using passwords that are at least eight characters long. You want to make sure you're mixing it up with upper and lowercase letter characters where you can. Some websites don't allow you to use those, um, but numbers and symbols, mix it up. Um, Don't use your birthday or your kid's birthdays or, um, you know, the town where you were born. Something that somebody, if they get a hold of your information, that they might be able to guess. Um, try to use different passwords for every different account you have, and that gets a little crazy, but there are new apps out there that are f- pretty secure as far as you can put things in, and it encrypts your, your accounts and your passwords for all these different accounts we all probably have. 
Um, you don't want to use sequential passwords like password one, password two, password three. Um, have a former colleague who used to work at banking. When they start you out there, you get banking 01 as your first password. And this person's on about banking 69 right now. So um, not that we would sell anybody your password, Holly. <laughs> anyway, no. <laughs> you don't want to use sequential passwords. Um, you want to make sure it's something. And, and for that matter, just the word password as your password is the number one used password in the country. When hackers get this information, that's the fir one of the first things they try is the word password. So um, it's not as clever as you might think. Um, we've got a couple other examples up here. You know, you do, again, you don't want to use the sequential things. Find things like, you know, I love to golf, we have as, a, as an example up here. But where you change in the last one, where it goes from good to better to best, um, change the O's to zeros, change the E's to threes. Do things that, you know, you'll know, but somebody else would have a really hard time figuring out. So, um, we've got a couple other examples of, you know, if, if the security question is what's your mom's maiden name and you put in Doe, it's probably better to put in, you know, Jane Mary Doe or, you know, then make, we've got the Jane Mary Doe with the A's as um, ampersand, not ampersands, what is that called? The at sign. <laughs> Thank you. Um, things like that. So it's just, it's being, it's being wise with the characters that you're using and trying to switch things out so that can't be easily guessed. Um, because again, the, the most common passwords are password and then birthdays and um, things like that. So. so if you find out that your identity has been stolen and compromised, what can you do? One of the first things we recommend is to actually file a police report. Why? <laughs> the police may look at you really funny if you come in and say, I need to file a police report because my identity's been stolen. But what it does is for your credit card companies, your banks, um, things like that, it gives credibility to the, your filing. It's like I actually w took the time, went to the police, and filed a formal complaint and report. You want to make sure you contact every financial institution that you do business with that might be linked to whatever account was compromised. Um, you want to close any accounts that have been tampered with. Um, you want to contact the credit card company or your debit card immediately if it's been lost or stolen or if you realize you've got a charge. Um, personal story is one Saturday morning I was at the grocery store and I walked in the door and the phone was ringing. And it was my financial institution saying, were you just at Giant and did you spend forty six sixty three? And I'm like, yes. And they're like, okay, did you buy gas last night at the, you know, the, um, Turkey Hill for, you know, $35. Yes. Did you buy a computer at 3 o'clock in the morning from China for 600 and No. <laughs> no, I did not. So um, they were calling to verify at 8 o'clock the next morning because a weird transaction went on at, in the middle of the night from China. The interesting thing there was that a, a couple of days before, I got a $1 charge on my account. And I saw it because I check mine almost every day. And it said Apple. And I'm like, did I buy an iTunes song that I forgot about? Although those are usually 99 cents or $1.29. But it was a dollar. And I'm like, well, it must have been me or maybe it was my husband. I don't know. And I let it go. That was the sample. They got my information somewhere. They tested the number to see if it would work. Nobody disputed the $1. So then suddenly there's a $653 computer being purchased. Now, my credit union stopped it immediately. But that was one of those things that, you know, if you're vigilant about looking at your online statements, you can really stop these things before they start. Because there's usually that little tester beforehand. That was a side note. Sorry. <laughs> but good information. Um, you want to make sure you're checking your statements carefully for exactly what I just said. Um, every month or sooner if you can do them online. Um, you want to look at your credit card card statements for other charges that may not be yours. I also had a charge show up one time on a credit card statement. I'm like, this is not mine. And when they pulled the receipt, it was in Michigan, and it was not even my name. And they found out somebody had manually entered the credit card. So there was no theft. It was just it was an error. But if I hadn't really looked closely at my credit card statement, I might have let that charge just fly. And um, if I'm not paying attention, so it's good to go check your statements thoroughly every time they come in. Lastly, you want to file a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, the FTC is looking at trends not only you know nationwide but globally, and they're trying to crack some of these rings because, again, it has become one of the largest white-collar crimes out there. The average victim loses uh, about $2,500, um, but it can be a lot more than that. Um, 
so it's it's important to stay on top of this and again um, if your customers are showing you that they're being maybe a little irresponsible in some ways you could say hey you need to be more cautious giving out your information or having other people help you um, with your ATM card or whatever it might be.